As he mentioned, my name is Gabriel Cardona. I'm a developer evangelist from Mava Labs. I have some notes here, so forgive me if I'm bouncing back and forth between eye contact and my notes. Um, so I don't know what the farthest anybody flew in from, but I flew in from San Francisco last night. I landed about 8 p.m., so it's like 1 a.m. for my body right now, so forgive me if I seem a little jet-lagged. I'm trying. So today we're going to be talking about building bespoke uh, VMs with Avalanche Stateful Precompiles. We'll talk a little bit about uh, what Avalanche is, then we'll dig into what Stateful Precompiles are, how they fit into the Avalanche ecosystem, and then if we have time at the end and we can get everything working, we'll give a brief demo. If not, we have a booth downstairs. Uh, we're going to be here all day today and tomorrow at the booth. I'll have my laptop with me, so if anybody's interested in seeing this in person, please just come and find me at the booth, and I'll be happy to demo. So very briefly, uh, what is Avalanche? Avalanche is a global financial network for the issuing and trading of all digital goods. And we enable potentially millions of validators to process tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of transactions per second with near instant finality. And we do that using a protocol which is completely green and quiescent. And we have tied this high throughput, fast finality protocol with an architecture which really meets the needs of uh, decentralized apps and unique financial services. And we accomplish this through this notion of subnets. So basically, subnets allow anybody anywhere to spin up a tailor-made network. You can have custom virtual machines. You can have complex validator rule sets. You can have inter-blockchain uh, communication, inter-subnet communication. So the way to think about Avalanche is it's a bit different than traditional blockchain networks that exist of one virtual machine and one set of validators or miners. Avalanche is really a network of networks. And we envision thousands and thousands of these public and private subnets to all emerge into this global marketplace, which we are calling the Internet of Finance. So Avalanche really has three paradigms which set it apart from its competitors. There is Avalanche Consensus, which is immutable and irreversible sub-second finality. So we consider Avalanche Consensus to be as big of a leap forward from Nakamoto Consensus as Nakamoto Consensus was from uh, Classical Consensus when Satoshi released Bitcoin. There's also subnets, as I mentioned, which are tailor-made networks, and then there's also virtual machines. And um, uh, we feel like this is a really big... Uh, breakthrough in scalability, interoperability, and flexibility. And the core breakthrough in Avalanche subnets is the ability to run multiple blockchains powered by different virtual machines. And each virtual machine is um, optimized for a special use case. Think about a dApp chain. So the entire Avalanche uh, network is, has very broad um, technical capability built on all of these different virtual machines. And so in the context of this presentation, which is building bespoke virtual machines with Avalanche Stateful Precompiles, uh, the EVM is a really incredibly efficient way for developers to get started because they can build on a code base which has been around for nearly a decade. Um, they can leverage worldwide resources like uh, developers around the world. There's also a lot of institutional knowledge. There are battle-tested and uh, peer-reviewed code bases. And um, it's just a really great way for developers to start. So we have multiple ways to create custom virtual machines. We have a Hyper SDK. We also have a Rust SDK. And then we have what we call Subnet EVM, which is an instance of the uh, Ethereum virtual machine with 100% backwards compatibility with existing tools and workflows. So if you're familiar with deploying smart contracts on other EVM networks, you'll have 100% backwards compatibility on Avalanche, but what's really cool is we have this notion of stateful precompiles, which allow you to add functionality to your virtual machines. So, um, I was going to briefly go over the Ethereum virtual machine, but I think at this point, I'm not sure I have too much time, plus this audience is relatively technical. Uh, the main thing is simply in 2013, Vitalik and his crew envisioned a way for developers to launch decentralized applications built on a blockchain. And to accomplish this, they needed to execute uh, arbitrary complex computations in a secure and decentralized way. And from that idea is when the EVM was born. And so the EVM operates as a quasi uh, Turing complete machine. That means it can run pretty much uh, execute arbitrary complex computations in a secure and decentralized way. And given enough resources, it is also isolated from the main network so it can provide sandbox environment for smart time, uh, smart contract execution, excuse me. Again, so these are just some of the primitives and abstractions that come with the EVM. So you have end user accounts. If you're an end user of the um, Ethereum virtual machine, chances are you're an end user account. There's also contract accounts. These have codes associated with them, but they cannot execute it on their own. They need to be instructed to do so by an externally owned account. 
We have cryptographic key pairs. So of course, we use the SEGP 256K1 curve on ECDSA key pairs. And um, basically, we just generate private keys, which are 32 bytes. Um, two to the 256 is the entire address space. So something I just think is kind of interesting uh, while we're waiting here is um, you can generate 10 to the 77. So two to the 56 is 10 to the 77. That's how many potential private ECDSA keys are in the address space. And then there's 10 to the 80 atoms in the visual universe. The reason I mention that is because if you're familiar with the Bitcoin space, they often, you often hear the, the term strength in numbers, and that kind of gives you a sense of what they're talking about when they talk about strength in numbers. You can literally create an avalanche address or a Bitcoin address or an Ethereum address for nearly every atom in the visible universe sans three orders of magnitude, which is obviously a lot. We have these 20 uh, byte hex addresses, so basically you just KCAC 256, the public key, and truncate the 64 byte hash to the rightmost 20 bytes. And then the last primitive is transactions, which are the smallest piece of work that can be included in a block. And so these basically represent a state change and uh, are either moving data between accounts or moving either Avox or Ether around the network. And then we also have blocks, which are a series of transactions that have been validated by miners, bundled together, and then linked with a previous block. And you can see this is all the stuff that it contains. So. Um, now we want to talk about precompiles. So precompiles are a great way to execute code written in a low-level coding language such as Go from within the EVM. So if you're familiar with Python programming, you might already be familiar with this kind of paradigm. Many uh, functions in Python are actually implemented in the programming language C because it's a bit more um, efficient than dealing with Python. And then Python developers can import these modules and call them. As a matter of fact, Node.js does the same thing with C++. So precompiles are a very similar concept. Um, Precompiles can be called from within a Solidity smart contract in the same way, and they're written as if you're calling another smart contract. So a good way to think about this is this address right here. You can see this 0x2 address. So this is the stateful precompile that maps to the SHA-256 hash function, and you can call it exactly like you see here at the bottom. So you can see on the right, the uh, number that's being put in is encoded, and then on the left, the uh, result is saved to the variable out, and the variable OK indicates if the precompile was executed without errors. And precompiles go all the way back to the uh, Ethereum yellow paper. So in April of 2014, when the Ethereum yellow paper was issued, if you go to Appendix E, which you can see in the screenshot, it already talks about stateful precompiles. And there were, I believe, nine of them, I think, that's on this list, that, issue, uh, that went live in Geth. They're still in the code base. They're also in. Um, core ETH, which is our fork of Geth, and then and many other forks of Geth, like Nitro, et cetera. And you can see that they're all cryptographic functions. So you have SHA-256, RIPMD60, you have um, multiplication and elliptic curve um, uh, addition. You also have the Blake B hash function and a couple others. And as I mentioned, why would you want to do precompiles? There's seven, several value propositions. So the first is performance optimization. Still got a few minutes here. Uh, performance optimization. So precompiles are primarily used to optimize the performance of specific types of computations. Adding a new uh, precompile can significantly reduce the computational resources required to perform certain tasks, which can improve the performance of smart contracts and decentralized apps. So for example, think about the SHA-256 hash function or the RIPEMD hash function. These are examples of precompiles that significantly improve uh, your performance. If you had to implement cryptographic functions in Solidity, it would be very slow and inefficient as well as awkward to write. Um, but you can use something like Golang, which is much more convenient to uh, read and write, and then you can call these as if they were just regular smart contracts. We also have access to Go libraries. So since precompiles are implemented in Go, um, you can utilize existing Go libraries, and Go has a very, very rich ecosystem excuse me, of third-party libraries, and so accessing them um, avoids the need to re-implement them, and so you um, significantly re reduce the risk of introducing something like a security error or a performance error or something like that. There's also gas efficiency, so um, adding a new precompile to the NVM can make a lot of computation super gas efficient. So think about things like um, the identity precompile, which is 0x04. All this does is copy and return, uh, return input data, but it offers a gas efficiency because, again, to implement something like this in Solidity would just be slow and super expensive. You can have advanced features and functionality. 
So by adding new pre-compiles to the EVM, it's possible to introduce new cryptographic features and functionality, which is what I'm hoping I can demo here. But again, even if I can't demo it, I can talk about it, and I can demo it later at our booth if you're interested. But things such as complex uh, mathematical calculations, data structures, et cetera, you can introduce these all using something like Golang, which is much more convenient, um, and you can have way more advanced functionality than if you had to use simply uh, solidity. So think about elliptic curve um, operations such as EC add, EC malt, EC pairing, et cetera. Uh, these are critical for uh, implementing ZK snarks, which are a form of zero knowledge proof in the EVM. So these were implemented initially as stateful precompiles going way back in the um, Ethereum yellow paper, and then they've been used all these years later to leverage into ex advanced functionality such as ZK snarks. And then lastly, there's interoperability. So some pre compiles can enhance the operability of the EVM with other blockchain systems. So for example, the BLS 12381 elliptic curve operations, so these are pre-compiles 0x0a through 0x13. They were added in the uh, Istanbul upgrade. They uh, enhance the EVM's interoperability and allow for operations compatible with the BLS signature scheme, and this can facilitate inter-blockchain communication. So we recently launched something called Avalanche Warp Messaging, which is a way you can have inner subnet communication, and we leverage specifically BLS signatures to do that, leveraging these elliptic curve operations, which are added in Istanbul. So um, I don't think we're going to pull off a demo. Again, gentlemen, it's not a huge deal. Don't worry about it at this point. Um, so there's several precompiles which come bundled with uh, the subnet EVM. You can restrict who can deploy smart contracts. You can restrict who can actually submit transactions. You can mint native coins. So when you spin up your own subnet, you're going to have your own gas token. Uh, when you do that, you can airdrop to existing addresses. And if you want it to be a variable uh, capped asset, you can actually mint who can native, uh, you can actually configure who can mint native coins on your subnet. You can configure dynamic fees and you can change the fee reward mechanism. So for example, today on Avalanche, we burn all of the fees, but you can change that. What if you wanted to give the fees, for example, to um, different validators of your subnet, for example. So we have a tool called Avalanche Cli, which is what I was hoping to demo here, but it's just a command line tool that very quickly allows you to spin up subnets. You can add validators. You can have permissionless subnets and uh, permissioned subnets. We call permissionless subnets elastic subnets. Um, you can have them be public and private. There's all kinds of different levers you can pull for regulatory compliance. We feel that Avalanche is really set apart from many of the other blockchain ecosystems when it comes to regulatory compliance. And you can do all kinds of fun stuff, and it has built into it the different pre-compiles, which I just mentioned. So one of the demos that I do is show that you can take an address, you can add it to the transaction whitelist, and then you can spin up a subnet and go to either Core Wallet, which is our wallet, or you can go to MetaMask. MetaMask works as well. And then you can um, spin up the subnet, airdrop some funds to an address, and show that address A can deploy contracts, can send transactions, et cetera, but address B or account B cannot. And we do that via Stateful pre-compiles, which again, I'm happy to demo after this at the booth downstairs. So yeah, thank you guys. Um, I really do appreciate it. My name is Gabriel Cardona. You can find me, CG Cardona on X. Check out Avox Developers, one word, Avox Developers on X. We do, uh, every two weeks, we do a developer community call where some of our core developers from our, our engineering team uh, take questions in advance over social media and Google forums, and then they do an hour-long uh, session where you can call in in real time and kind of get a sense of what's happening with the uh, Avalanche developer community. So check out Avox Developers. Most importantly, if you take anything away from this, please go right now and check out academy.avox.network. So recently, we launched our own academy with the intention of um, helping developers on-ramp into being Avalanche and Web3 developers. Uh, we're looking to make this an accredited course. Uh, hopefully, in the future, we'll offer NFTs or NTTs or something like that to th show that you've passed the course. But really, we just um, know that one of the greatest benefits that we can add to the ecosystem is helping developers to on-ramp into the Web3, not just Avalanche, but Web3 in general, Avalanche-specific e uh, ecosystem. So please check out academy.avox.network. Um, that is my time. I'm going to go right now down to the Avalanche booth. We have a booth. We have several members from our team. I'll be down there today and tomorrow if anybody wants to connect and talk about uh, blockchain technology. We also have another one of my teammates that'll be here tomorrow at what time? One tomorrow if you want to hear a coat speak about. There you go. I have a cloud, which is very cool. Spin up your own cloud from Web GUI, which we think is going to be like the AWS of blockchain experience. But that's it. Thank you for everybody who joins. I appreciate it.